undergraduate at ASU. And he's going to tell us about the effect of blood proteins on uh, surface affinity for medical and plant devices. All right, so as you mentioned, I'm Brett Hughes. Um, real quick, just to point out everyone um, in the group, uh, I work for Professor Herbo at Arizona State University. Uh, my fellow researchers are Ashley Murphy, Ross Bennett Kennett, myself, and uh, another student, Haju Ajaria. Um, we also work with Professor Culbertson um, and students that have graduated, David Sells, Taylor Cutts, and Sophia Benitez, as well as our advisor, Calista Watson. Um, we've also done extensive work with other physicians, uh, Dr. Culbertson at University of Michigan, and Dr. Clive Sells and Dr. Huang with the retina consultants who have done our clinical trials. Okay, so uh, to start off, the motivation behind our research, uh, we're looking at lenses that have been artificial lenses after a cataract surgery. Uh, with cataract surgeries, as you can see, you have fogging on the lenses. They're a very common surgery, they occur worldwide, um, and it causes fogging in the lenses. With a replacement artificial lens, you remove these proteins clogging the lens, and we have about 15 million surgeries of occurring every year. What our research focuses on are surgeries that occur after cataract replacement, such as a retinal displacement. Um, when surgeons go in on a patient that has had an artificial lens implanted, what they see occurring is fogging on the lenses, um, similar to, uh, well, I'll go on to that for a um, The other applications, in addition to these artificial lenses, are laparoscopic and arthroscopic lenses used during surgery, and then with fogging as an issue is the view of the actual surgery going on is obscured, and so physicians are forced to stop the surgery, wipe the lens, and then continue with the surgery. And so time of the surgery increases, which directly correlates with an increased infection rate, and also increased scarring and other complications with the surgery. Um, so to start off, the most basic fundamentals occurring in our solution to this problem is the hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity of a molecule. As you can see in our left slide here, a very hydrophobic molecule shows increased reaction, increased desire of the water molecules to interact with themselves, and they don't interact with the surface that they are on. Whereas with the hydrophilic material, you see it decreased water um, cell interaction and more interaction with the lens itself. This is another um, slide detailing it further where you can see as water is more hydrophilic, it begins to spread, whereas hydrophobic, you see more pooling of the water. So, to combat this, we came up with vitriox, which is a material mesh. Um, so, as it is stamped now without any application, you see 3D film on the IOL surface, and so what actually causes the fogging is this trapped air in between the different water droplets that are forming on nucleation sites on the lenses. So, as we apply vitriox, we see that this 3D film can actually be transfer, transferred into a 2D film. And so rather than prevent condensation occurring on the lens at all, what we actually have is that we have a 2D film forming that can be seen through. So, experimentally, as we set this up, we have artificial silicon eyes that we use to test um, with the IOL lenses donated by Boston Loam they go into this actual lens that we test on. Um, we use a balanced salt solution, which is the exact formula, the exact solution used in an optical surgery. And then we apply our actual vitriox formula through this very small port here onto the underside of the lens. Um, the per our, we perform our experiments at about 40 degrees Celsius because uh, during a surgery, the body, the body runs a slight fever, um, and so we want to mimic that as closely as possible. As, you can, as I mentioned, what we do is go in through this port right here, and so uh, we apply using a curved syringe our actual vitriox material to the underside of the lens. As you have a buildup of the vitriox, and then with removal of the vitriox, only the two-dimensional film is left behind that spreads out our water droplets. So as you can see, this is your regular lens occurring. And so this is where a surgeon would have to stop the surgery, wipe the lens, and continue on with the surgery. 
once we've applied the IOL, you can see, once we've applied the vid to the IOL, you can see that the fogging doesn't occur on the lens where the vid have been applied, and surgery can continue. Um, and then as I mentioned, we control the thickness of our film by extracting the excess vid that is left behind. So this is going to be our four lenses that we test at a time. And so here you can see the condensation occurring. Um, in the middle here is the lens itself on both of these. And then here you can see where the condensation is not. The condensation is occurring, but fogging is not occurring. And so up here we have used acrylic eye wells, which are not as popular, but then also the silicon eye wells that are more popular and used more frequently. Oh, I'm sorry. So as you can see, we have exactly what we expected to occur with no condensation forming on our lenses. So the, we used, we had 20 different clinical trials and a 90% success rate. The two trials that did not perform up to our standards are when blood occurred on the, blood came into contact with our lenses. And so what we began to do is work on expanding vitriox into protonox which will actually ideally prevent blood from ruining our vitriox application and from preventing blood from fogging on our lens as well. Um, one of the, rather than study all the blood at once, what we began to do is we studied individual blood proteins. Um, we started off with heparin because it is an extremely electronegative, which would suggest that it would bond very tightly, and also that it's used in all trauma situations, um, IVs, surgeries, anything, heparin is proof because it is the very common anticoagulant. So we began testing with heparin to make sure that it did not interfere with our vitriox application. The second protein that we began to work with was fibrinogen. Uh, fibrinogen is present everywhere in blood, similar to heparin, and fibrinogen is the main protein that, occur that causes clotting to occur in your blood. This clotting occurs when it starts to starts to produce fibrin, which is activated by the enzyme bromine, and fibrin is what actually creates the fibrous proteins that form the blood clot. Um, so what we began to do is we took fibrinogen and applied that to our actual lens in a 2D film, similar to how we applied the vitriox, where the fibrinogen would be put onto the lens, excess would be removed, and the film would be left behind, and we get a molecular mesh on the lens of our fibrinogen. This fibrinogen was prepared by using a phosphate buffer. Uh, it needs to be stored at about negative 80 degrees Celsius. The thawed with a water bath and centrifuge, and then we used six different dilutions of the fibrinogen to test a wide variety of what would work best with our vitriox applications. As you can see, 18, 12, 9, 6, 3, 1. Uh, for our actual applications, we use our one and three tested on the lenses directly. So once we had applied our fibrinogen, we used the saline vitriox again, um, and we mimicked as many different tests as we could. Uh, we applied before and after. Our results were very promising in that fibrinogen did not interact with vit vitriox. We continued to have our transparent here where the surgeon could still perform off the surgery without fogging. And then we tested this on five different materials, SI-100, uh, abused silicon dioxide, uh, amorphous silicon dioxide that is placed onto silicon 100, microscope slide, and the actual IOLs themselves. As you can see, we tested all five at once to minimize variables, etc. Um, here you can see again, no fogging on our IOLs. And then, so in conclusion, once we had, with our fibrinogen mesh, along with the vitriox, did successfully continue to prevent fogging without obscuring our vitriox application. And then blood has also I'm sorry, our future applications are that we will continue to test other blood proteins as well as whole blood itself to ideally eliminate all other future complications with our protonux model. Uh, from there, I'll take questions because I'm sure I skipped something.
Let's thank Brad and all the speakers for a very nice session.